Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campion. I'm, of course, the producer over here at Collider Video. And this is kind of the more laid back, relaxed, informal show that we do over here at Collider Video. And it is the weekend that we now officially live in the post Star Wars The Force Awakens world. I'm sure a lot of you have already seen the movie multiple times. I know I have seen it multiple times. You have seen it multiple times. Oh, yeah. Speaking of you, my co-host again today, Miss Wendy Lee. Wendy, how you doing? Hi guys, I'm good, how are you doing? You've now seen Star Wars twice, twice. working on three yes. pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So it's been a, a pretty big weekend. You know what was crazy? We, um, a bunch of us, you, me, Schnepp, Dennis, uh, a bunch of us went over to uh, and our, our own, well, it used to be our own, uh, Jennings Roth Cornette, mm -hmm. who's now over at HitFix. She came with us last night, too. So a whole bunch of us went over to the AMC Burbank 16 on, when did we go? We went Thursday, Thursday night, night. To uh, watch the film again. And overwhelmed the whole night by how many of you guys down there came up and talked to us and stuff. We took a lot of pictures and like that. So thank you to everybody who was down there and, and came over to say hi. We always love it when you guys do that. But... Uh, Enough of that. <laughs> we want to get to your mailbag question. How do you get a mailbag on our show? How do you get a mailbag question on our show? Simple. You just email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. Just send on in your email anytime. Take a shot and see if we can get your question on either our weekend mailbag shows or maybe on Movie Talk Monday through Friday. Can't guarantee they'll get on because we get an awful lot of questions sent into us, mm -hmm. but we do our very best. So with all that out of the way, Wendy, what's the first question of the day? This one comes from C. Carter, who writes, Hey, Collider crew. My question concerns the Elf movie that was announced in 2012. I used to watch the TV show all the time when I was a kid and was very excited when I found out that a film was being created. However, since then, I have not heard anything concerning the film and was curious what you guys know about the film's status. Yeah, um, everybody remembers Elf. Mm -hmm. Elf was fun. Yeah. Elf was, do you remember Elf's real name? No. It got revealed in the show. Do any of you guys remember Elf's real name? Gordon Shumway that got really? revealed. I can't remember what season it got revealed, but his real name was Gordon Shumway. Likes to eat cats. Very uh. funny. Uh, anyway, back in 2012, uh, there was talk about developing motion pictures and Sony Animation Studios came along. They were going to do it. And the plan was they were going to do it like the Smurfs. It was going to be uh. half live action, half CGI. Now, in the Smurfs version, the Smurfs were CGI in the real world. I got to hope that Elf was still going to be the puppet because mm -hmm. that's what everybody knew and loved and remembered was the puppet Elf. Maybe they were going to do a CG Elf or maybe they were going to do a hybrid where some scenes is the puppet, some scenes you see him running around and that would be CG. I don't know how they were going to do it. But the guy who did the voice, uh, David, uh, no, Paul Fusco, I think is how you say his name, the guy who did the voice of Elf in the TV series. He was going to come back and do it for the movie. The plan was to do it. It was going to be a hybrid animation style. And then it disappeared. And then it just absolutely disappeared. Um, and as far as I know, it's 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 dead. It's a dead project. It's not that, oh, it just got delayed a little bit. Um, from all the stuff that I know about it, they just decided it can't work. Uh, maybe something else they tried took precedence over it. Maybe something else they did didn't quite work quite as well. And they just ultimately decided this wasn't a good idea. Or maybe they just took a couple cracks at the script and thought, we just can't crack it. We can't crack that code about what would make an elf movie work today so as far as i know the alien life form movie elf is dead no oh, that's kind of sad i really liked elf when i was growing up i liked it I saw it in taiwan so i watched it in english with chinese subtitles on the bottom but it may not work in a film you know uh mm. format but do you think maybe now with netflix around maybe it would have worked as that i'm telling you what i think it would have worked as a film Really? I really do. As a matter of fact, this is one of those properties I think would work better as a film than as a TV series. Because in a TV series, I think when you're drawing on that nostalgia factor, I think the concept can get tired by episode eight. It's like, okay, we get it. He's funny. He's a wisecracking alien. Mm. Huh? Maybe by episode eight. But as a movie, two-hour movie, boom, boom, get in, hit the laughs, get out, and leave him wanting more. I think it could have worked. But again, it really depends on making sure you got the right script that works the right way. Do you think enough of the audience remembers it fondly? Do you think parents would want to get introduce their kids to it? All these questions come into play because if you're going to do it hybrid-wise, like animation merged in with live-action environment, that ain't cheap to do. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at a 
big investment to do that as a movie. So that means you got to expect a big return on it. And maybe they just could never get to the point where they felt comfortable that they could ensure themselves, their investors, the heads of the studio that we are confident we can make $275 million if we do that. And if you can't do that, then you can't green light a big budget project. Too bad though. Yeah. All right. What's next? Ted Metzby writes, my question is, do you think that Star Wars Episode Eight, which as we all know, will not be directed by J.J. Abrams, could be as good as Abrams' The Force Awakens? Obviously, Ryan Johnson is not a household name yet. Do you think that he will be able to deliver since the story development is incredibly important for the next episode? Also, the visual and action standards set by J.J. are very hard to match. Thanks and may the Force be with you always. J.J. did a great job with Star Wars Episode Seven. I mean, he was, you've heard me say this in the past week or so, ever since I saw the film, but he was tasked with a Herculean challenge of make a new Star Wars, make a new Star Wars based on the most beloved film franchise in history that will both appeal to those fans of the originals, the lifelong fans, and appeal to new fans and new generations of followers today and do it all in one movie. In It's an impossible task. J.J. did it. He absolutely did it. Um, and he did a great job. So the question is, can Ryan Johnson live up to that standard? I'm going to tell you this right now. I believe this wholeheartedly. Ryan Johnson's a better director than J.J. Abrams. J.J.'s great. And as a film executive, because remember, his real background is kind of like being the executive producer on all these shows, and he produces a lot of movies, and he's going to be a producer, by the way, on the upcoming Star Wars films and all that kind of stuff. But I think right down at the heart of it, I believe Ryan Johnson, just purely talking about the director's chair, I believe Ryan Johnson is the better director. I really do. So I, yes, the answer to your question is yes, especially now that you know, J.J. and uh, Kathy Kennedy and Lucasfilm and Disney have done such a great job of now kicking it off. The first one's under the belt now. The first one's the toughest. And the first one's under the belt now. They've started off a great new world for us to explore and play in. And with that now done, a lot of the heavy lifting already done, now Ryan Johnson can come in and just not worry about creating this thing. He can now worry about building on this thing. And I believe in the hands of a director like this, when you look at films of his like Brick or Looper or, or things like that, he has just been amongst cinephiles, like one of the best directors. And everybody loves Ryan Johnson. There's a reason everybody likes him so much. You're right, he's not a household name, but his household name is not an indication of his talent. Mm -hmm. This guy's uber talented. He is great. And he will do a great job with episode eight. I'm predicting episode eight will be even better episode seven not because ryan johnson's better than jj but it's going to be a mixture of because jj did i don't know that ryan johnson who is as just a pure director i think is a better director than jj jj wasn't just the director of episode seven i mean jj had a lot of he was also one of the producers on the film he's the writer of the film you know I think episode eight will be better than episode seven because one of the reasons is jj did such a good job creating this new world kicking off, you know, restarting this franchise, bringing in these new characters, reintroducing us to the originals. And because that's done, that's 50% of the job, Ryan Johnson will now come in and do the other 50% of the job of building on top of that. And I think eight will be even better than seven. A lot of the people who are seeing the new Star Wars film, Force Awakens, are saying that the Force Awakens is like the new, a new hope. Do you think that mm. the Ryan Johnson version is now going to be like the Empire? Well... I think there's, you've seen, this is no spoiler, I think you've seen this around online a lot, that a lot of the beats of Star Wars, uh, The Force Awakens, follow the beats of Star Wars A New Hope. And I was totally fine with it, to be honest with you. I, I really, really was. I think that was part of the recipe to make it, because remember again, J.J. had to make everybody, this whole multiple generations of people who love the originals, make it feel like home again. And I think, by splashing in some of the similar beats from the original, I think that helped. I actually think that's something they needed to do to achieve the results that they did in this one. Now, that being said, the second film in a new trilogy is often the darker one. It certainly was for the in the case of uh, Empire Strikes Back. And we talked about this on Jedi Council the other day, myself, Tiffany, and Christian. 
we really do think that the next one is going to be the Empire Strikes Back of the new trilogy. This is going to be the one that's probably going to be the darkest. You know, the first one introduces the world and the wonder of it all. The second one is the dark times. The third one is the triumph, you know? Mm -hmm. And I believe that will be the hero's path or the hero's journey, if you will, for this franchise as well. I think you're going to see bad things happen in Star Wars Episode Eight, uh, whether it's at the hands of... Uh, well, I won't say characters because that might be considered a spoiler. Mm -hmm. Either at the hands of some of the villainous characters or 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 because of other reasons. But I think bad things are going to happen in episode eight to set up the triumph of episode nine. So may maybe they'll go in a completely different direction than that. It's quite possible. But yeah, I kind of do think they're going to go that way. And I also wanted to point out something that you guys said on Jedi Council. Uh, that J.J. and Ryan Johnson have been working kind of together, I guess, to patch between uh, Force Awakens and then the next Make sure movie. it's a smooth transition. I yep. like that so much. And oh, yeah. I hope they continue that trend. Two of the great minds in the filmmaking business today collaborating like that can mean nothing but good things for us. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? Alex writes, Hey guys, big fan from Greece. You took upon yourself the unbearable task of doing commentaries for the Star Wars prequels, but didn't get to do the commentaries for the original movies before the Force Awakens came out. When should we expect your awesome commentaries for the original Star Wars trilogy that are great movies, unlike the prequels? Thanks and keep on being great. You know, it's funny. We came up <laughs> with this idea of let's do like just not really proper commentaries, but just you know, us sitting around watching the movies so you can watch us and feel like we're all hanging out together and watching the movies together and we'll talk and, and rub a little bit in um, in those commentaries. And we thought it would be fun for like 10,000 people would download them. We got the first three done, all three prequel films, The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith, we got those done. Each one has over 100,000 downloads, wow. which just blew us away. We, we thought... 10, 15,000 people would download them. And like each one of them has like over 100,000 downloads, which by some YouTube numbers, that's nothing special. But for us, that's way beyond what our expectations were. Um, now, our plan was to get all six Star Wars movies done before The Force Awakens. But we underestimated the time commitment. I mean, it's huge. And you've got the schedules of myself, John Schnepp, Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis. And we had some opportunities to do them without one of us or without two of spare, but we really thought it was important to make sure we do them with all of us there. Our shooting, you gotta understand guys, our shooting schedule in our studio right now is crazy. It's packed. We are, it's just go, go, go around the studio all the time. When we're not on camera shooting, we're writing, developing, editing, whatever. Uh, we're on location, we're just doing a lot of crap. and. We, it or turned out to be a really big challenge to find three hour chunks of time that we weren't supposed to be shooting something else that Mark and Christian and me and Schnepp and Dennis doing all the technical work were all available to make it happen. Um, it was a bigger challenge than we thought. So we are still going to do the remaining Star Wars films. We're aiming to get them all done in January. So coming up soon, they won't, there won't be any new ones before the new year. Uh, because we're already starting to kind of drift away and vacation. Mark's now gone for his holidays and uh, Tiff's gone for her holidays. And, you know, so it's going to be hard. But come January, we are going to knock those remaining three, the original trilogy, which is the ones we really want to do. We're going to knock those ones out. And then because of the response you guys have given us about these commentary things, you would not believe how many people tweet to me pictures tweet and Facebook me pictures of them with their television on with, you know, one of the Star Wars movies and their laptop right in front of them with us four ugly mugs <laughs> sitting there watching the movie too and or having two monitors on on their uh, computer stand, two monitors, one's got the movie, one's got us. It is in hundreds, hundreds of people sent me these pictures. So because of that, we start talking maybe like once a month we should do this. Let's pick a different movie every month and we'll just do one a month forever now. It's a regular thing because people seem to be enjoying it. We really love doing it. So yes. So to answer the question, the original or the original trilogy, we'll knock that out by the end of January. That's what we're aiming for. And then like we'll aim to do one new one a month moving forward. And certainly the Force Awakens when that comes out on DVD. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. Like, are you ready for that when in a, in a few months, I guess, when the DVD comes out? 
to do the commentary and how much fun that's going to be for you. It's going to be loads of fun. I can't wait because the, the uh, to geek out about the things we love, to rip on the things we think they made mistakes in. And be able to talk openly now. And being able to talk openly is, is great. When we shot our spoiler, by the way, our spoiler review, if you didn't know, is now online. It's like an hour and 12 minutes long. Um, it was so great to finally be able to sit down at this desk, all of us, and just not have to worry about spoiler. <laughs> we just talked openly about it. It was so much fun. Can't wait to do that for the new commentary as well. All right, what's next? Dale Harrison writes, Hi guys, Eddie the Ego is well known here in the UK. I don't know if he is anywhere else. I know the story and want to see the film after seeing the trailer. But my question is, will the rest of the world want to see it? Or are they hoping that Jack, Hugh Jackman's star power will help? Um, I think people will see This is not going to be a $200 million movie. This is not going to be a $250 million movie. But those Olympics that... Eddie the Eagle participated in, those were in the Calgary Olympics. So I was, it was in Canada. So as a Canadian, we remember that. Um, Eddie the Eagle became an overnight sensation. People loved him and were cheering him on. Not to win a medal, he was never gonna, he came in <laughs> last place in every single event. But that he was there and he competed and he jumped and he landed and he was such a great underdog story. And so I think even if people, if you saw the trailer just came out this past week, I thought the trailer was exceptional. I really liked the trailer. Even if people don't know the story of Eddie the Eagle, I think there are going to be a lot of people that see that as a really feel-good human story. This is one of those movies that, that people just like to hear. It's the, those stories that make you feel good. The types of stories that make you feel more faith in humanity and see the goodness in the world. And... Eddie the Eagle and the story of him is one of those stories to me. So I think the people who are old enough that they remember the 88 Calgary Olympics, they'll remember the name Eddie the Eagle. And those who are young, too, were too young to remember it or just didn't follow the Olympics or whatever, I think when they see that trailer, they're going to be into it as well. So this is a movie that maybe makes $21 million, $18 million opening weekend. I'm just assuming they did not make this for a huge budget. When you watch a trailer, it doesn't feel like a big budget film. This is a movie that can be successful. Not a giant blockbuster, but it doesn't need to be. So I do think this movie will do well. I really do. I literally had no idea who Eddie the Eagle was until oh, I saw great. the trailer. So now that I've seen the, uh, the trailer, I want to see the movie. And I honestly didn't feel the pull of Hugh Jackman being in the movie made me want to see it more or less. Like, it could have been any other actor. Yeah, it, it, I, I want to see it. I mean, part of the reason is because Hugh Jackman plays, apparently he looks like he plays the role great, mm -hmm. but it's not because it's Hugh Jackman. Like, the, the draw for me isn't, oh, because it's the kid. I bet you I bet you most people have no idea that that's Eggie from Kingsman, The Secret Service. <laughs> is Eddie yeah. the Eagle. I bet 90% of the people out there had no idea that was him unless they read about it in advance. And so that's not going to be the draw, and I don't think the draw is going to be that Hugh Jackman is in it because, you know, Hugh Jackman just did Pan, and look how that turned out. People mm. didn't flood just oh, because yeah. it was him. He is one of the best actors working in the business today, but it's not like people are just going to flood out and see it just because he's in it. Um, but it looks like he's great in the movie. It l looks like Egerton, as Eddie the Eagle, he looks wonderful. I, I'm, just, I'm just smiling thinking about the damn film. So, yeah, I think it's going to do okay. I like those glasses that he wore. Oh, so good. <laughs> yeah. So good. All right, what's next? Oren Dominique writes, did concussion miss award season? The trailer looks promising as well as Will Smith's performance, but I'm not hearing any nominations. Yeah, no, um, concussion came in under the wire. It, it qualified for all the awards season stuff. It just didn't get a lot of nominations. Um, the one most notable nomination that concussion did get was Will Smith got a nomination for best actor in a drama at the Golden Globes. Which means nothing, but oh. it's still, the Golden Globes are totally <laughs> useless. But, um, but it is it is an, an award nomination it did get. Uh, I which I'm a little disappointed. Now I haven't seen Concussion yet myself, but I know it's one of the ones that's really been on my radar a lot. Number one, because Will Smith seems in the past five, six, seven, eight years has really seemed to excel in these types of roles. And the story, as a sports fan, the story itself is fascinating to me. So I'm a little disappointed that I'm not hearing better things about it at this point. Still looking forward to seeing it a lot. But uh, yes, it did qualify. It did get in there. It just didn't get the nominations aside from Will Smith getting one of the Golden Globe nominations. K. 
can you tell everybody, because I'm not too sure, too, when exactly is award season? Well, award season, usually for most things, it's it's by the end. For, for example, um, the Academy has a deadline. I believe it's December 31st that your movie has to screen in New York and Los Angeles uh, in at least one theater mm -hmm. each uh, to be eligible for the upcoming Academy Awards. Uh, other awards bodies will have like dates like by, oh, by December 15th, it has to be screened for our awards body or something like that. So award season is basically, the competitive season is basically between November and the end of December. And then the big awards start getting given out come January until the Oscars come out. So I think like AFI already gave out their awards. They, AFI doesn't name one movie. They AFI, the American Film Institute, they name um, the 10 best films of the year in no, in no order. They just say, these are the 10 best films of the year. Uh, and I believe Star Wars uh, made, yeah, Star mm -hmm. Wars got on the list, was one of them. Um, the Broadcast Film Critics Association, they just named their, uh, their nominees. Boston and LA film critic groups already named their winners. Um, so did, oh, there was another major one, not the press. Ah, one of the critic ones. At any rate, mm -hmm. but the big award seasons happen after New Year's. So we'll get the Golden Globes, the Broadcast Film Critics Association, the SAGs, the Directors Guild, uh, and of course, ultimately, the Academy Awards, which are coming in the end of April, February. February, at the end of February this end year. End of February the this year. right? Yep. Yeah. All right, what's next? Kay writes, hey, Collider. Well, as we all know, not only was Gem on the Holograms a critical and commercial failure amongst critics and angry Gem hard fans, but it was a box office toilet bomb. <laughs> so my question is, will this be a lesson to studios and even filmmakers to respect the properties and their source material? And will we ever see a reboot slash new adaptation of Gems and the Hologram, ho Gem and the Hologram that is more faithful to the source material? Nope. <laughs> that ain't gonna happen. No, no, no. That is not gonna happen. Um, and let's be very clear here. Gem and the Holograms was not a sucky movie because it didn't respect the source material. That's not why it failed. It failed because it was an ass awful movie <laughs> with some of the worst trailers that have ever, you know, been put on a big screen. That the movie just looked horrible right from the beginning. Um, you know, it's funny when a movie like Gem comes out. The, there are some people that come out and say, see, you need to stay faithful to the source material. But when a movie like X-Men Days of Future Past, which in no way, shape, or form stays faithful to the source material, uh, when a movie like Captain America Winter Soldier comes out, which very little stays faithful to the source material, when, when those movies come out, you don't hear people saying anything. The fact of the matter is, Gem and the Holograms was a bad movie because it was a bad movie. You could have made a Gem and the Holograms movie that had nothing to do with the original source material. I, me personally, I would have said, hey, come on, guys. This is based on, on, on a, to some people, beloved 80s cartoon. At least resemble what that, <laughs> that was in some way, shape, or form. That's what I would have done. But that being said, you still could have made a Gem in the Holograms movie that didn't even resemble the 80s cartoon at all and still made a good movie. You still could have done that. You know, X-Men, I keep going back to like X-Men Days of Future Past is not like the comic book, but they made a great movie and that's what counts. That's what fans want. Fans want great movies. They really, we may say we care if it's six the original material. We don't care. What we really care about is a great movie. So you get Captain America, Winter Soldier, or the upcoming Civil War is going to look very, very, it's, it's going to have some th thematic similarities to the comic book, but it's going to look quite different. A, a Winter Soldier was very different than the actual comic book storyline. X-Men Days of Future Past, very different. But they were great movies and so that's all that counts. You cannot give the studio and the filmmakers of Gem and the Holograms a pass just because they didn't stick to the source material. That's giving them a pass. No, they made a bad movie because they were incompetent. And, I mean, maybe they're great filmmakers, but on that project, they did a horrible job and made a bad movie. We've all had, I've had, you You know, I've done terrible shows. You know, Schnepp has had bad days. Dennis has had bad days. We all have bad days. Gem, so no, nothing wrong with that. Gem and the Holograms was their bad day. 
uh, they just made a crappy movie and they cannot use as an excuse, oh, the one thing we did wrong was not to be faithful to the source material. No, no, no. You did a thousand things <laughs> wrong. It wasn't one thing. It was a thousand things. So I'm going to tell you right now, had they stayed true to the source material, the movie still would have sucked because they made a bad movie. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. We really don't care. As fans, we may think sometimes that we wish, I mean, we know we, it's fair to wish they stayed close to the source material, but as fans, we may think we need them to stay close to the source material, but that's not really the case. What we deep down, what we really desire and what we really want is just a great movie. And if they give us great movies, which other studios have that have taken a lot of liberties with source material, and we've seen movies that have been very faithful to source material that have been absolute garbage too. So it all comes down to good movies. And I do not think we can give the, the people behind Gem and the Holograms a pass and say, oh, they just made the one mistake. Just the one mistake of not being true to the, no, 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 a thousand things. This was death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. Speaking of um, rebooting franchises like Ninja Turtles, that was an 80s cartoon, yeah. Transformers. Is there something that you love, you know, like a cartoon that you want to see reboot? I would love to see Thundercats. Oh, Thundercats, ho. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, Panthro, who's Chitara going to hook up with? I mean, the big question. I thought her and Tigra would. But I, I mean, I, I, I think... I think there's potential there for Thundercats. I yeah. think you can do some really good Thundercats. And, by the way, look up... There, there are two really great things that you got to look up on YouTube, okay? Please try to remember to look this up I'll on YouTube and, and give me like, that we can okay. put this in the notes later, okay? There are two things in particular. Um, I think in like 1999 or like the early 2000s, I can't remember, somebody took footage of Vin Diesel movies, Brad Pitt in, what's that, the one he played Achilles, Troy. Brad Pitt in Troy and a bunch of other things, but used After Effects and colorized them. So like Vin Diesel was Panthro and Brad Pitt was lion -O, and then somebody else was Tigra, somebody else was Chitara and they put this thing together that made it look like a legit, remember this is like 10 years ago so the technology mm -hmm. for a fan was not very great but they put together a Thundercats trailer that is so funny to watch. It's so funny to watch. It's a gr one of my favorite mashup trailers ever. So look for that. You might already know the one I'm talking about. But then there's this other one where it's um, James McAvoy. Look this up. Look up on YouTube, James McAvoy Thundercats. And it's somebody, it's an interview James McAvoy did. I can't remember who he did the interview with, but somebody asked what he'd like, and he goes off on Thundercats. He says, I mean, talks about the Thundercats movie you could make, which was like really, really funny. So you should check those two things out. The Vin Diesel, Brad Pitt, Thundercats trailer, and the James McAvoy talking about a Thundercats movie. Really funny stuff. Awesome. All right, what's next? Nikki Falacho writes, hey guys, big fan of your show. I've been watching it every day since your days at AMC. Well, thank you. I have a question regarding Star Wars, Rogue One, and all of the Star Wars anthology films. Do you think they will have a crawl in the beginning, or is that something specifically for the numbered episodes? I feel that they'll probably still have it, but I want to know... I'm sorry. But I wanted to get input from you guys, since you are the Jedi Masters. <laughs> Anyways, tell me what you think, and may the fours be with you. It's a great question. It's a great... Like, because... On the surface, you think it's a Star Wars movie, so you do the opening crawl. That is part of the DNA of a Star Wars movie. But this could be a visual cue for the filmmakers to create a distinction for the fans between the episodic Star Wars saga and the standalone anthology films. Because the for those of you who may not know, like the episodic saga, episode seven, episode eight, episode nine, episode ten, episodes one, two, three, four, five, it's all part of one continuous connected story. The anthology films are going to be one-offs that are kind of like either a uh, hand solo standalone. Uh, Rogue One is going to be about, you know, the the rebels that steal the original Death Star plans. Then you're going to have a movie about this. And you're gonna have a movie, so they're all individual standalone films. So you could make the argument that if the filmmakers at Lucasfilm wanted a visual cue to differentiate between the saga and the anthology films, not having an opening crawl would certainly be a stark visual reminder that these are two different things. However, I tend to believe it's still a Star Wars film. There's still Star Wars films and the opening crawl 
is one of the most distinctive, one of the most unique, one of the most identifying markers of a Star Wars movie. And that's the opening crawl. And then the pan down in the star field and all that kind of stuff. You, I feel like you got to do it. So me personally, I think they're going to stick with it even for the anthology films. I'm kind of the opposite from you. Really? Yeah, um, because I just wanted, because they're kind of standalone movies, yep. I wanted to see something different that distinguished uh, from this, the episodes. Yeah, versus, a visual cue. To, yeah. I, I wouldn't be shocked mm -hmm. if they did that. But I, I do think no other movies have the opening crawl. Unless it's Spaceballs and they're mimicking <laughs> Star Wars, right? No other movies have them. That is their unique identifier. So while I won't be shocked if they go away from it through the anthology films, I'd still be surprised, not shocked. Now, if they weren't going to do the crawl, right. how would you want to see it open? Do you think they jump right into the story? Jump right in then. If you're not going to do the crawl, don't even have it open in credits. Mm -hmm. Just Lucasfilm. Don't, and if you're not going to put the crawl, don't put a long time ago in a galaxy. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, you could still put long time ago in a galaxy far, far away because that still applies. Screen goes dark and then bam, screen comes <laughs> up right in the middle of an action sequence. Just don't waste time. If you're not going to put the opening crawl there, just dive right into it. Save any credits or anything like that for the end of the film. All right, what's next? Christopher Peck writes, have you heard about this whole thing with Tarantino and Disney? According to Tarantino, Disney forced some big movie theater in L.A. to violate their contract with Tarantino, which allowed The Hateful Eight to play there starting December 25th in order to have Star Wars play there the entire holiday season. And if they wouldn't, then Disney would pull Star Wars The Force Awakens from all arc light theaters. This really angered Tarantino with him calling it extortion. So have you heard about this? And if you have, is it true? And what are your thoughts about it? Thanks for producing such great online content. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I have heard about this. And honestly, to quote Shakespeare, I think it's much ado about nothing. Mm. I really do. Um, because from what I understand, now, there is a big if here. There's a big if in this that could tilt the scales either way. But let's put that if to the side for a second. We'll come to the if in a minute. My understanding is simply this, that Star Wars right now, look, every movie studio with every movie they put out negotiates their own contracts with theater chains. With Star Wars films, this goes long, even back before Lucasfilm was owned by Disney. Lucasfilm and the Star Wars movies have always had very high demands with their theatrical contracts. Like you want to put our movie in your theaters, you got to do this, 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 and this. Very, very high demands, which is understandable. They're a Star Wars film. They can do that. So they've done that even before Disney was ever involved. My understanding um, is this, and I'm not claiming to be totally in the know on this. I'm not, I'm just saying this is my understanding of the situation, okay? So take this with a grain of salt. My understanding is any movie theater, for instance, the AMC Burbank 16, which is right across the street from our studios, any movie theater that wants to show Star Wars The Force Awakens, you have to commit to a five-week run. If you want our, our, our movie in your theater, you got to commit to a five week run. Now, I don't know that that means you have to play it on six screens in your theaters for five weeks. You just got to commit that Star Wars is going to be playing in your theater for five weeks. Now, all that being said, uh, there is a iconic movie theater here in Los Angeles, right in, right in Hollywood called the Cinema Dome. Mm -hmm. You actually see it in the beginning of Entourage, in the opening credits of Entourage. They just put different letters on it to spell it some producer's name. I can't remember what, but um, the Cinema Dome is literally this big giant dome. And it looks like the inside, it's all, the roof looks like a big beehive. Uh, so have you ever been in the yeah, Cinema Dome? Yeah, it's a pretty cool thing. I don't like watching a movie in there because it's got this curved screen that throws the perspective out. I don't, personally, I don't like it, but it is a very cool place. Um, and they are one of the few places in the country that is equipped with a 70 millimeter projector, which is how Tarantino wants to project his film. Now, the Cinema Dome, wants to have Star Wars play there. And unfortunately for The Hateful Eight, Star Wars has this thing. Look, we're telling all theaters, you got to commit to a five-week run. If you want to show our movie, you got to commit to a five-week run. And with that being what the people of Arclight, the company that owns the Cinema Dome, being faced, they made the decision, sorry, Quentin, but we think that Star Wars The Force Awakens is going to make us, and we're a business, 
we think Star Wars The Force Awakens is going to make us more money than The Hateful Eight will. And I don't think Quentin Tarantino would argue that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, Qu Hateful Eight may be a better film than Star Wars The Force Awakens. We don't, I haven't seen the film yet. I'm going to see it this week. Um, but it's from a business point of view, Star Wars Force Awakens is going to make more money than The Hateful Eight will. So Arclight made the decision, we're not going to let you play the film here when you when we originally thought we were going to let you play it in here. Star Wars is going to have for the full five weeks. Now, Quentin Tarantino is very upset by this. Um, and when I first saw his interview, I think... I think Quentin was misinformed a little bit in his comment because he didn't talk to Disney. He talked, he strictly talked to the people at the Cinema Dome. And Quentin Tarantino said, um, when Tarantino's on the Howard Stern show and explaining the situation, he left out the fact, like he was just explaining, a lot got a lot of people mad because he just said, Disney came along and said, no, don't let Quentin Tarantino show Hateful Eight here, just show our film. He didn't mention that actually this is a nationwide policy. This isn't just Disney picking on Tarantino and they, because that's the way the story came out at first. And how I heard it at first was sound like Disney was just pick, picking on poor Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Why would you want to pick on Quentin Tarantino and the hateful Eight? Why would you want to do that? And then I looked into it. It's like, oh, this is actually a nationwide policy. They're not picking on Quentin Tarantino. They just have a rule that has to apply to everybody. If your theater wants to show our movie, you got to commit to a five week run minimum. And Alma Doan was not an exception to that. Here's the if, though. Because at this point, I'm thinking, damn, Quentin, that sucks, but Disney didn't do anything wrong. They just didn't do anything wrong here. I mean, that sucks for you, because I know you really wanted that film in the, in the uh, Cinema Dome, and that kind of sucks. I think a lot of people would love seeing it there. But hey, this is business, and that makes sense. But then comes the if. And here's the big if. This could change it from being, no, Disney, this was totally fair, to Disney are being total dicks. And I, and I don't know which one it is. In the story, the way Quentin Tarantino tells it, he says that the Disney people, now remember, Quentin was not in the room for these conversations. He's hearing all this secondhand. Mm -hmm. Quentin Tarantino said, that Disney told Cinema Dome, owned by Arclight Theaters. Arclight is a chain of theaters, okay? Um, here in the Los Angeles area, I'm not quite sure how big their chain is outside of the LA area, but they got a number of wonderful theaters in the Los Angeles area. I really like the Arclight Theaters very much. Quentin Tarantino says that Disney told Arclight, you have, if you want our movie in the Cinema Dome, it's got to play for five weeks. And if you don't, we're not just pulling Star Wars out of the Cinema Dome. We're not going to let you show Star Wars in any Arclight theater anywhere. And this is the if. I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. Star Wars wants to play in Arclight theaters. Um, and that would be completely contradictory to how Disney is handling every other theater. For instance, AMC theaters, right? There's an AMC theater, there's the big Burbank 16 right there, but then just over here is another AMC theater, the AMC 6, mm -hmm. right? And AMC 6 isn't playing Star Wars The Force Awakens. Did Disney say to AMC, play our movie in the AMC 6 or we're not gonna let AMC theaters <laughs> show this movie? No, they didn't. I'm sure they didn't do it to Regal, I'm sure they didn't do that to Cinemark. And I have a very hard time believing that Disney did that to Arclight. I have a very hard time believing that. I don't think Quentin Tarantino's lying. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that at all. I think Quentin, I just think maybe Quentin Tarantino either A, misunderstood what Arclight was telling him, or B, maybe Arclight was embellishing the truth a bit when they were explaining it to Quentin Tarantino. So Arclight looks like, oh, it's not our <laughs> fault, Quentin. I, I think Quentin has either been misled or maybe he misunderstood them. But that is the big if. Because if Disney actually did say, yeah, we got this rule for every other theater, but for Cinema Dome, where Quentin Tarantino wants to play Hateful Eight, if you don't do what we want to do in Cinema Dome, we're not going to let you show Star Wars in any of your theater chain. Anywhere, Arclight. You're not going to be able... If they did that, that... I would be just disappointed in Disney. And everybody knows how much I love Disney. But if that was the case, I would be disappointed. I just have a very, very hard time believing that that's the case. I, once again, I do not believe Quentin Tarantino's lying. 
But I do have a feeling that, look, if I'm an Arclight guy and it's my job to get on the phone and tell Quentin Tarantino, the Quentin Tarantino, that, sorry, dude, we got to pull your movie. We're not going to show it on our screen. I have a feeling that guy might be motivated to embellish the truth a little bit to deflect some of the wrath of Quentin Tarantino <laughs> off me and put it on to Disney. Now, I have not talked to anybody at Disney about this. I have not talked to anybody at Arclight about this. I have not talked to Quentin Tarantino about this. But it, on the surface, my belief of this is that it doesn't make business sense. That mm -hmm. Disney would say, if you don't show it in this one theater for five weeks, we're not gonna let any of your theaters show it. That makes no sense at all. I believe it is simply a situation Disney said, if you want to show it on this one screen, it's got to be for five weeks. And if you're not, then you don't get to show it on that one screen at all. And Arclight said for Cinema Dome, well, we think Star Wars Force Awakens will make more money than Hateful Eight, so we're going to do that. And I think that's probably the end. And I think Quentin Tarantino, I think maybe somebody embellished the truth to him a little bit. Yeah. But who knows? Who knows? That's the big if. And I'm going to be very, very curious to see how this all plays out in the wash. I can't help but feel bad for Quentin Tarantino because he Absolutely. chose to show the film in 70. That's like his baby. And yep. that's the one place he's able to, you know, show show the film the way it's supposed to. So do you think in the future, directors and studios are going to stay away from the opening weekends of Star Wars films because yeah. of this? Yeah. It's a big thing. Um, well, I mean, look, and it really wouldn't be that big of a thing for Hateful Eight mm -hmm. if it wasn't for the fact that... Quentin is specifically looking for 70 millimeter houses and there's not tons of them. And the Cinema Dome is an iconic, you know, in his interview with um, Howard Stern, you know, one of the things Quentin Tarantino said, he said, look, I grew up in Los Angeles. The Cinema Dome means something to me. He has a, Quentin has a personal uh, investment in this as well. Like, it's one theater. Is one theater going to make or break Hateful Eight? No, but there's emotional value there. Quentin really wants to play this movie there. He thought he had a deal in place to make it happen. And then this Star Wars situation came along. And so will studios want to maybe... So if it was not 70 millimeter, I don't think it would affect Hateful Eight at all. Mm. It's just that it's it's a bad combination of circumstances between the 70 millimeter thing, when Star Wars is putting out, the fact that it's Cinema Dome, the fact that it's Quentin Tarantino, and the fact that it's Disney. It's this perfect storm of everything coming together to create a really, you're right, it's, it's a sadness and unfortunate situation for Quentin Tarantino. I feel really bad for him in this situation. I feel bad for him, but I don't really think there's anybody at fault right. here. Like, even though I think somebody's getting screwed, you know, Quentin Tarantino's getting screwed in this situation, it's one of those situations where it's really just the circumstances. I don't think anybody's doing the screwing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, Somebody's getting business. screwed, but I don't think anybody's doing the screwing in this. So it, it's just business. So I hope it works out well for everybody. And Me I hope if late does great. And I know Schnepp saw the movie already and he freaking loves it. I'm going to yeah. see it this week. I cannot wait. So we'll see how it all plays out for Quentin Tarantino. All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this weekend's mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, do us a favor. If you like this video, do us a big favor and click the thumbs up button. It's a great way of easily communicating to us that you like the videos that we're doing and help us spread the word about all the videos we do over here on Collider Video. Take this video, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook, and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And listen, if you've got a thought or a comment about any of the questions that we took today, jump into the comments section and leave your thoughts, add to the discussion. I want to thank my co-host today, the lovely Miss Wendy Lee. Wendy, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Wendy Lee Zaney. And thanks for having me back. And thanks for being had. And of course, you can follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, simply at John Campia. I want to thank Dennis behind the camera there for doing all the work to make this production work. And thank you to you guys so much for joining us. So that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Mailbag. We'll be back with Movie Talk on Monday. And until then, bye-bye.